Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. In the last video, we discussed the algorithm for converting a queer rectangular environment maps to cube maps and we looked at how this is implemented using code that runs on the CPU. This conversion can be made faster by an order of magnitude if you were able to run it on the GPU. Today we are going to see how this is done. We'll use DirectX 11 API to run a compute shader that performs the conversion. The shader code is similar to the C++ code, except now it's much simpler since we don't have to worry about format conversion. Let me open nmapprocessing.hlsl in VS Code. Here I define the constant for pi and a sample offset, which we use to sample from the center of the pixel. We have a constant buffer that provides data that are sent from the C++ side. Cubemap in size will be used after we converted an environment map and passed the resulting cube map back in again for pre-filtering. So right now we don't use it. Cubemap out size is the size of the cube map after conversion. This is the size we set in the editor. Note that this is always 256 if you want to pre-filter the cube map. Sample count is also only used for pre-filtering. However, we'll misuse it as a toggle for mirroring the cube map, as we'll see shortly. Finally, the roughness is also only used in the pre-filter shaders. The equirectangular environment map is passed in as a shader resource view. The output is a read-write 2D texture array, where we can write each face of the resulting cube map. This is attached to the pipeline as an unordered access view, or UAV for short. We use a linear sampler to sample from the source image, which results in softer cube map images. Next are the two functions that we discussed in detail in the last video. They are exactly the same as in C++, so I'm not going to explain them here again. The first one converts a normalized position on a cube map face to a direction vector. The second function converts this direction vector to a UV coordinate in the environment map, where we can sample a pixel. The compute shader itself is fairly simple. It's basically the same as the sample cube map face function in C++. It's executed in blocks of 16 by 16 threads. The face index is contained in the Z component of group ID system value. If you're not familiar with compute shaders or you'd like a refresher on these system values, feel free to watch this video where I explain the basics of compute shaders. We exit the shader if the thread indices map to a pixel that's outside of the cube map face or the face index is larger than 5, which shouldn't happen obviously. We use the thread indices, which effectively map to pixel positions on cube map face, to calculate a normalized UV position. This UV position is rescaled and offset, so it's in a range between minus 1 and 1. This is used to get the sample direction, which is converted to a sample position within the environment map. Again, the X component is flipped if we need to mirror the cube map. As I mentioned, the sample count field from the constant buffer is used as a toggle. It doesn't really contain a sample count. The value that we sample from the environment map is written to the texture array. The face index is used as the index into the array. And that's all there is to it. Now let's look at how we can compile and upload the shader bytecode to the GPU. We could include this HLSL file in our project and use Visual Studio to compile it, but I'd like to be able to add multiple compute shaders in the same file, and as far as I know, we can't use Visual Studio to do that. So I looked at how it's done in DirectX text library, where compute shaders are used for BC6 and BC7 texture encoding. Here I included a link to a file on GitHub, where we can find a command file that compiles the shaders. Our file contains a simplified version of this code. I'm not going to explain every command here, but feel free to look them up in the documentation of DOS commands. 
As you can see here, we are going to use the FX compiler. I added a variable that holds the command line options. We are targeting shader model 5. The PC FXC variable holds the path to the FXC application. This macro will be provided by MS Build when we build the project. I'll show you how that works in a minute. In addition, it will also provide an output directory for the compiled shaders. However, if that's not defined, then this default location will be used. The directory is created if it doesn't already exist. Next, we call compile shader, which is like a function in this scripting language. Here is the implementation of the function. There is a variable that contains the command for executing fxc with the file name given in the first parameter. The second parameter is the entry point or the compute shader function that we want to compile. It uses the command line options and outputs two files. Because we want to include the compiled shader in our C++ code, we can use this option to output a C++ header file containing the shader's object code as an array of bytes. The name of the array is defined with this option, which is simply the file name underscore the function's name. The second file is the debug data, which we don't really need but might be handy if we are going to try and debug with PIX, for example. Here we output a message that we are compiling this function. The fxc command is only executed if this file doesn't exist. This is why you should always remove it if you want the changes in your code to be compiled again. Here you can see the compiled folder that contains these two files. We can remove this folder in order for the shaders to be built. Visual Studio can't detect if any of the source files was changed, so we have to trigger a build by removing the output files. Of course, I'm open to suggestions if you know of a better way to do this. Now we have to run this command file whenever the Content Tools project is being built. By the way, since I had to reinstall my PC, I accidentally installed a newer version of Autodesk FBX SDK, so if you are a Patreon supporter with access to this codebase, then make sure to set this path according to your installed SDK version. We also set an additional include directory that points to the compiled shader location. You have to do it once for debug and once for the release build. You can add it here manually or by using the project property page like so. Make sure to select all configurations if you are adding it here. In order to run the command file and pass it the location of the fx compiler as well as the compiled shader output directory, we need to add a pre-built section to the project file. This consists of two parts. The first part compiles the shaders, whereas the second part is run when we clean the project. Here we create two variables named shader headers and shader symbols which contain the paths to the compiled shader headers and debug files. Then, when we clean the project, all files that end with .inc and .pdb are deleted in those paths. When building the project, the first section is executed as a pre-built step. Here we use this macro to get the location of the fxc executable. This is already defined in Visual Studio. It consists of multiple paths that are separated by semicolons. We split the paths and take the first one, which is the location of fxc. If the path is not empty and hasn't got a trailing slash, we slap one to the end of it. The command file is executed next, where we set the environment variable in order to pass the fxc path. We also set compile shader output variable, which we see here. Now we can compile the shaders anytime we delete this folder or clean the project. Here you can see that two files were added. The one that we are interested in is the .inc file which contains the shader bytecode. Since it's a regular text file, we can inspect its content. 
Here we see the assembly code for the shader. It's excluded from the code by a pound if condition. And here we see a byte array constant with the name that we defined in the command line options of the FX compiler. This is a regular array of bytes which can be included in our C++ code. We can put it in its own namespace. So the shader's namespace now contains a C constant, which is an array of bytes. We'll see how this is used in a minute. Let's look at the conversion function, which has the same parameters as the one for CPU conversion, plus a D3D11 device pointer. Again, we use a constant size if we want to pre-filter the cube map. In Direct3D11, we run the GPU commands using a device context. The easiest way to do this is by using the immediate context, which as the name suggests, will execute the commands as they come in. We need a resource in GPU memory that will contain the resulting cube map. This cube map can't be accessed by the CPU. If you would like to read it and save it to a file, we must first copy it to another resource that's in system memory and therefore accessible by the CPU. So here we create two texture resources by filling in a texture 2D description and calling create texture 2D. The first one is written to by the GPU. That's why it has an unordered access bind flag. Note that the array size is the number of environment maps multiplied by six so that we have one cube map per environment map. The second texture should be readable by the CPU, which is indicated by the CPU access read flag. Our compute shader is uploaded next. We call create compute shader and pass it the array of bytes that contain the shader bytecode. This is everything we need to do in order to compile the shaders and embed their bytecode in our application binary, where we can upload it to the GPU. Now we need a constant buffer to pass the cube map size and if it needs to be mirrored or not. I made a function that creates a buffer resource. Here we fill in a buffer description and call create buffer. It has the constant buffer flag and CPU access flag so that we can write our data to this buffer. Once the buffer was created, we can set the members of shader constants and copy them to the buffer. I added another function for copying the constants. In this function, we map the buffer to system memory, which gives us a pointer to a location where we can copy our data. Unlike DirectX 12, the buffers in DirectX 11 need to be unmapped before they can be used by the GPU. Next is creating the linear sampler that we need for sampling the environment map. I made a function for this too. The filter is set to linear and what's also important is that we set the address modes to clamp. Before attaching the resources and the shader to the pipeline, we first clear everything that might have been set. This shouldn't be necessary since we reset everything at the end of this function anyway, but it doesn't hurt to clean up beforehand either. In this function, we have a block of memory that's filled with zeros, and we call each function with the maximum supported slots in order to detach everything connected to the pipeline. Now we are ready to convert each environment map to a cube map. Most of the time we only have a single environment map, but we also support multiple environment maps that will be converted to an array of cube maps. So for each environment map, we create an unordered access view that points to a cube map within the array of cube maps. Again, I wrote a function that creates the UAV. For view dimension, we specify UAV texture to the array. The array size is in this case 6, and the first array slice is the index of the first cube map face in the array of cube maps. Now it's time to upload the environment map itself. To do that, we create a texture as before, and this time we also provide an instance of subresource data, which points to the pixels of the source image and specifies its row pitch. After creating the texture, we also create a shader resource view so that our shader can sample from it. 
At this point we have everything in place in order to run the compute shader. We can dispatch the compute shader with the number of thread groups we calculate here. Since the compute shader runs in blocks of 16 by 16 threads as specified in the shader file, we have to round up the size of the cube map and divide by 16 to get the number of thread groups needed to cover an entire face. As we saw earlier, the face index is passed as the Z component of the group index. Setting it to 6 here will run thread groups from 0 to 5 in the Z dimension. The dispatch function simply sets the SRV, UAV, constant buffer, sampler and the shader before dispatching compute shader threads. After this is done for each environment map, we reset the pipeline and proceed to download the resulting cube maps from the GPU. Here we copy the GPU resource to the CPU resource so that we can read from it and write it to the result scratch image. We have to make room in here to contain the pixels of the CPU resource. Therefore we'll initialize the scratch image according to the type of the texture we are trying to download. Then we loop through the mipmaps of each array element and copy it row by row. This is because the row pitch of the resource could be different from the row pitch of the scratch image. In order to read from the correct sub-resource, we calculate the index of it using the MIP index and array index. The resulting index is used to map the sub-resource to system memory and read from it. We call onMap after copying the sub-resource row by row. This was all the code for using the GPU for converting to cube maps. Let's have a look at the whole CPP file for environment map processing. Before ending the video, I'd like to show a few small changes that I made to the C++ code. As I mentioned, I updated to a newer version of FBX SDK, so here we set the library paths accordingly. I added two new constants in math types header file. We use them here in this function. And finally, I switched back to using the Lambert diffuse function, since I forgot to do that in the last episode. And that's all for this video. We are going to look at the code changes for the editor in the next one. As always, thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you next time.